Hello, welcome to Diversity TV. This is a special segment uh, shot out of sequence. Um, given uh, the times, we're actually shooting this during uh, in July during the Olympic trials in Eugene. We have a special guest who I'll introduce shortly. Uh, Diversity TV, as you know, uh, roughly corresponds to the season. The seasons roughly correspond to LCC terms. We're in the middle of summer term, technically. I'm on vacation, but be that as it may, uh, when the time is on you, you move. So uh, go to slide for a second. So our episode today, uh, I call The Trials of an Olympian, Margaret Johnson Bales. And just if you're tuning in to D Diversity TV for the first time, just to acquaint you with our mission, it's to illuminate everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it. So. To that end, um, coming out of some of the work uh, that Sherry Turpin and I did and uh, with I2M Eugene, a local multicultural history project, uh, this segment that we talked about with Margaret uh, setting records running in a dress. Uh, if you've never seen an Olympic gold medal, this is what one looks like. She competed in the Olympic Games in 68 in Mexico City, ran the second leg of the 400 relays and the American women won gold over the Cuban team, and their team set both an Olympic record and a world record there. So though she won Olympic gold for a country at age 17 while at a student, as a student at Eugene High School, she was not offered a scholarship at the University of Oregon until she was 32. And we'll talk about that in a little later. So with the run-up to the Olympic trials, uh, this story uh, that appeared in the Register Guard on May 11th, uh, with this, this headline, basically, the forgotten Olympian was basically shooting Margaret in her home in San Diego. Uh, the headline, The Forgotten Champion. So it was a story written by Curtis Anderson, published in the Guard May 11th of this year. So one wonders, uh, or the Diversity TV asked the question, how does one forget the only person from Eugene, so-called Track City, to win an Olympic gold medal in track. How do you forget that? So, if you, and this is a quote from the article, she's the only Olympic gold medalist to grow up in Eugene. So, the diverse TV answer is, in a town which celebrates only white male distance runners, who are often not medalists, you forget spe female sprinters, particularly black female sprinters. That's how you, f how you have a forgotten champion. So she's the first black female inducted into the Oregon Sports Hall of Fame in 91, and her prep records still stand 40 years later, unbroken. So who could forget that? Well, it was not forgotten here at Lane Community College, where both rites of passage, the African American experience, and articles in the Eugene Weekly as well as commentary by, on KLCC, as well as the work of Sherry Turpin and myself. So, but it was forgotten by the organizers of the Olympic trials, even though we did remind them about that, until they were also reminded by Margaret's daughter when tickets to the trials were apparently sold out. But right prevailed, and Margaret is here with us today in a special ed edition of Diversa TV. Uh, this is a a picture of her, an old picture of her coach, Wendy, and where is Wendy today? Edmonton. Edmonton, Canada. Canada. Okay. So if I may introduce Margaret Johnson Bales, welcome. Thank you. So your coach, uh, Wendy Jerome, was a phys ed teacher at Willamette High School when you first met. Could you describe that? Well, how I met Wendy was at the all comers meet that, that I wasn't supposed to be at. <laughs> I was supposed to be going to the uh, movies with a girlfriend. Okay. And we seen, um, it was at South Eugene. And we ha it was a whole bunch of kids and, and, and people over there in South. And so we went over there to see what was going on. And so we seen people running and jumping and throwing balls. And so we, it looked like fun. So we took our movie money and registered in, in, into the events we wanted to do. Okay. Okay. So I chose the 100, the 200, the shot put, and the long jump. Now, bear in mind, she's not dressed for track. 
Right. This. <laughs> no, I'm in a dress. <laughs> She's in a dress. Okay. In a dress. All right. And what happened? Well, um, I won all, all my events. And then, the, and then uh, this lady walked up to me and asked me if I had a coach. And I asked her what was that because I was nine. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't know what a coach was. And so she said, well, can I have your number? I can talk to your mother and I said no because <laughs> I'll get in trouble because my mother thinks I'm at the movies, the movies okay Oops. so she said she wouldn't tell my mother I was there she just wanted to talk to her so I said okay so after that we went home and Wendy called my mother and they talked and my mother invited her over and then um, then my mother told her well that would be a good thing for me to do to keep me out of trouble <laughs> so that's how it started. Okay. Okay. So um, besides using the example of another famous black female sprinter, Wilma Rudolph, um, she had some unique approaches to train you. Could you talk some, about some of those? The sprints, the starting places? Well, Wendy, her, her uh, technique was different than anybody's. That, mind you, I had other coaches prior to her. No. After she started with me, then she went back to Canada, then the, uh, Don Carpenter with the uh, YMCA and then Jim Puckett, they all helped um, train me. But with Wendy, hers was more, um, it's like I did 10 seconds, run all out, and then you walk back 10 seconds, then 20 seconds all out, then you walk back 10 seconds, and then 30, then 40, and then 50 seconds. And that was one way for her to get me in shape. Okay. Okay. Uh, the rest of the coaches were like, okay, run the straight, walk the curve, run the straight, walk the curve. Right. But hers was more technical. Okay. And it was more, um, it was harder. Yeah. You know, and I Sounds could, harder. Yeah, and I couldn't um, manipulate her, mm -hmm. which the rest <laughs> of them I could. <laughs> Why do you think that is? I think it's because I was a female and they have never coached a female. Okay. And Wendy was a female and she wasn't going for my okay. excuses. I mean, one of the things you said Monday at the, the running company was that uh, she was almost like your mom. Exactly. Even though she was a few years older than you. Yeah, and see, and at that time, I thought she was much older than me. Hmm. But she wasn't. So, you know, and I just realized that not too long ago that she wasn't that much older than me. Hmm. But at nine, you look at her, she, you know. Right. She's okay. teaching yeah. at Willamette. At Willamette, I mean, right. so she's, yeah. she, right. so that, you know, so that's how that happened. Hmm. So she's training you, she's using different training methods um, than uh, most other folks, and mm -hmm. they're harder training methods. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of things is she doing psychologically? I mean, had you heard of Wilma Rudolph before she talked no. about it? Okay. I didn't know anything about track at all before Wendy. Okay. And uh, so Wendy, because she was a psych major too. All right. Sports know, psychologist. Psychologist. Yeah. And so what she would do was she would gradually um, mention Wilma Rudolph. And I'd say, who is she? And she'd go and explain to me who she was. And then she'd say, you run like her. Hmm. Then she would show me footage of her. Okay. And I'll say, And you'll wow. see how she was mm -hmm. running. So how did she run? Well, she, how can I put it? Her, the way her legs, because I, the way I ran, I ran like this, mm -hmm. okay? And if you look at Wilma Rudolph, she ran like that. Hmm. She didn't run, you know, foot this way, right, but right. it was one was out right. and one was, and I, that's the way I ran. Yeah. And uh, her form. So if you look at her footage, you would think, and if you didn't know who she was, you would think it was me. Mm. Okay. Okay. That's how much alike right. we were. And so, uh, so she would tell me about Wilma Rudolph, and then she would, and the more I started complaining and training, then she would say, okay, you know, the uh, Olympics is coming up, and you could, you're good enough to go. You never thought that? No. And I say, well, okay, where is it going to be at? She said, Mexico City. Hmm, I want to go to Mexico. Okay. So, you know, she says, okay, so you have to, you got to continue to work hard and improve in order to go. 
So I said, okay, so she used that kind of psych. She, mm. she planted the seed mm -hmm. because I had no clue. Very tricky. Mm -hmm. But that's good because, yes. I mean, that's, um, you know, as an educator myself, one of the things that, yeah, and with degrees in psychology, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, she's doing some, what some of my, my old school black mentors did, mm -hmm. okay? You have to, you know, the old thing about, okay, you have to be twice as good to be considered equal, et cetera, et cetera, if you're going to compete in a larger world, right? Mm -hmm. So that means you're going to also have to train harder mm -hmm. and, you know, learn twice as much and stuff like that. So, and then have particular role models and usually right. black role models, right? So, I mean, she's doing that kind of stuff. So right. the harder training regimen, but uh, there was another thing that when we had talked with you like eight years ago and when you explained it again, it didn't occur to me. She trained you to start like 10 and 20 yards before the finish line. Yeah, that was part of my training. And like in, because I didn't have any competition here. Explain that. Okay. In the 60s, girls, there wasn't a lot of girls in track. Probably not, hardly none. And so the, the better I got, there, it was like I was beating everybody. So she would say, okay, at this track meet, you're going to set your blocks 10, 10 um, meters behind. So then that means the I would have to, line. Yeah, yeah, then I would have to catch them. And so that, and she said, don't look at it as winning or losing, look at it as a workout. Okay. And so we would do that. Then that didn't work for too long because I started beating them then. So then she started. <laughs> head start. <laughs> 10 meter head start. So, okay. So, you know, but these are girls, you know? And so then she said, okay, uh, well, she started entering me into meets with the boys. You know, so we started high school boys. That didn't work. And then she went up well, to college. Well, when you say that didn't work, you kept beating them. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. So that's what I mean by that didn't work. So I kept beating you know, the guys. And so she moved me up to the freshman and sophomore. In college. College. And um, coached by Coach Bowerman. Bowerman. Hmm. Now, Bowerman and Wendy didn't get along. Why? She was married to one of his athletes. Yes, she was, but he was black and she was white. And I guess the interracial marriage thing didn't fly too well in the 60s. Right, in especially Oregon. In, in, in Oregon because they were Canadian. So in Canada, they don't look at you as black right. and white. You, right. You're just a Canadian. Right. So she had to go, she had to fight a lot of diversity when she was here too. Okay. Because she was white, she's married to a black man and had an interracial child. Hmm. Okay. So anyway, Bill Byerman at first looked at, her, at Wendy as a joke. She didn't know what she was doing. And so I'm caught in the middle because I don't know what's going on. And so we go to the track meet and he let us he, he figured, okay, yeah, she can run. And then when I beat the, the freshman and sophomore guys, then the next track meet was the junior and senior. Okay, and so um, I came in like second and second in the hundred to the, to the juniors and seniors. And the 200. With a head start still. No, not oh, with the head start. You started even with them, okay. Even with them. Okay. And then in the 200, I came in, um, I think, third Third to them. Hmm. And then after that, Bill said, no more. No more? I couldn't do that anymore. So it got to be, I couldn't train on Haywood Field. So it, it was a lot of controversy there. I'm, I'm missing something, so you might have to explain this to me. Okay. Okay. So... I thought athletics was about fair play, performance, okay? Here you have somebody that's <laughs> clearly succeeding, right? So why not give them a shot? Because I was a female, and uh, Bill Byerman coached males. Okay. It was and a male there was thing. No fee there was no women track then, I Right. Understand. There was no women track. Wendy had started the first all-female uh, track club called the Cinder Bells. The, Be the Bethel Cinderella? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, and it wasn't that many girls on the team. Okay. 
And then when we went to national with Jim Puckett, there was only five of us. Okay. So, mm. you know, and then after, um, yeah, and that's when I was introduced to Wyatt Matthias and Barbara Farrell because yeah. nobody knew who I was. Right. Because most of my track meets were, that I ran in was in Canada. Right. So the Canadians knew who I was. And, um, but the U.S. they didn't because most of the athletes was L.A., Mississippi, Tennessee, right. all the Southern people. All the Southern people, right. And so, and they were and all who's college. This girl from Eugene? Right, and yeah. I was in high school. Wow. So usually you would uh, run in, t in the girls' division. And so in the nationals, I ran in the girls' division and then got moved up to the women's division because of my time. Okay. So right. they just wanted to see how I would do. Right. And when I beat Wyatt Matthias, then, all, then everybody said, well, who is she? <laughs> Where did she come from? You know, that type of thing, because they never heard of me. And they sat up and took notice when you beat her. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. And then um, Wyatt was uh, uh, Tennessee State coach called me up and asked me, you know, wanted to coach me because he thought I was a uh, college. <laughs> so he wanted me on the Tiger Bells, and when I told him I was 13, 14, he says, oh, no. <laughs> he says, okay, I, you have to wait until you yeah, get a little so. older. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Any special diets? No. No. No special diets, no special vitamins. No, nothing. We they got, used to reward you with what? A root beer float. A root beer float. Yeah. Okay. To keep me motivated. Keep they you say, motivated. Load up on those carbs. Yeah. If you <laughs> win this race, you get you get a large root beer float. I mean, we'll touch upon this later, but I mean, so the reason I bring this up, no special diets and just physical training, you're doing this without performance enhancing drugs. Right. I mean, sugar's a drug, but. But. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no yeah. none of what they're doing today, no. Yeah. It was just plain hard work and, I guess, talent. Hmm. Because we didn't have any, I didn't take any supplements. The only thing I think I took was some wheat germ oil. Okay. And some salt tablets. So describe the road to the Olympics then. Well, what do you mean? I mean, how I got there, yeah. or what was going on when before? So you I got were training there? for certain events. You got pneumonia. Uh, oh, and okay. You weren't a, well. You weren't allowed to train in Hayward, so. Well, no. Yeah. Uh, well, and actually, to be fair, you know, to Coach Barman, he didn't allow any women to train there, let alone right. one who beat but, his track team. But after I made the team, I proved myself. Then he offered to let me train there. Okay. okay. So then, you know, I, you know, I could train there. But um, Wendy was a little strong, bullheaded too, just like Barman. So it's like, okay, we don't need to train there. You know, their track's no better than anybody else's. So you've been doing fine without it. So we didn't go there. Okay. I think I did some wind sprints uh, a couple of times on the Hayward Field. Um, and then after that. Um, when I went to, um, yeah, I went to uh, Mount Sac for the trials. Okay. In Cal Southern California. California. Yeah. And um, that's when I realized that I was good. Because before it was just like, okay. It's a game. Huh? It's a game. You know, I go to the track meets, I run, I win. Okay. <laughs> and, um, but this one was more. This one was more important than the uh, nationals, and so it was like, okay, Wendy says, okay, this one is serious because in order for you to get there, you're gonna have to come in first, second, or third, right? In both of your events, in order for you to qualify to go to the Olympics. So I said, okay. So in the hundred, I um, tied the world's record. I beat Wayne Matthias. At what age? I was uh, just turned 17. Okay. Okay. Um, and that was in one of the uh, the preliminaries. Okay. 
And then I came back and did the same thing again. So I tied the world's record twice in one day. And then the 200, and it was funny, every, if I beat Wyman Matthias in the 100, she would beat me in the 200. Mm. If I beat her in the 200, she would win the 100. So we switched off, and I don't yeah. know why that yeah. happened, but that's just the way it went. Yes. You know, competition mm -hmm. can be like that. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so I, I, I qualified for the Olympics and came back home and continued training. And then uh, it was time to go to uh, high altitude training, which was in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Right, because New Mexico, oh, Mexico is at uh, high, high altitude. Yeah, right. So we had to have high altitude training. And we didn't go to uh, Tahoe because the men was in Tahoe, so they kept us separated. Okay. The men were in Tahoe, we was in Los Alamos. And uh, <clears throat> so that was the first time I had flown by myself mm. because Wendy couldn't go with me. And that was different, yeah. you know. And uh, we get there, and then the whole team is there. And so I had my workout regiment that Wendy gave me that I had to do because we didn't, we didn't work out as a team. I mean, not, we did our own thing, and uh, we, we uh, started practicing uh, the relay because the first four in the hundred is the relay right. automatic. It's right. not like it is today. And you still train as in, I mean, that was an issue. We, I guess they were talking about that on Monday, about, okay, sprinters train as individuals, but mm -hmm. when it becomes to a team, you don't train as a team. You don't practice right. standoffs or anything like mm -mm. that. Mm -hmm. We didn't until the day of the race for the, uh, the relay. Then, okay, yeah. but we practice in high altitude training. Okay. And they had me as first leg. They had Barbara Farrell as second leg. They had Mildred Netta as third and Ty as last. Well, the way I was trained by Wendy, when she says she wants you to go all out, that means 100%. Well, I don't know how they were trained because <laughs> when, the, when the coach says, okay, we're going to do this all out, my brain said 100%. Right. Okay. So I'm running 100%. I'm running all on top of Barbara. I spiked her once, and she thought I did it on purpose. You know, she's falling out on the track, and you know, all messed up. And and I said, well, she, they said to go 100%. So what were you doing? You know. Right. And so it's like okay. And so then they switched us. They switched Barbara to first and me to second. Okay. And then that worked out better because I didn't run her over. Right. So, but did you run the third person over? <laughs> no, Mildred, yeah. I didn't okay. because you know I'm coming out, and then she knew to go. Yeah. When we hit the hit the mark to go. Yeah. And um. And then her and Tyus, they they handed off. But then when we got to Mexico, well, no, until after that, then we did some track meets and um. Ran a couple of track meets and um. Then we went from there to Colorado. Now we're going from 100 and something degrees to 40. Oof. Yeah. And so I went to, to get my hair done and caught pneumonia. Ooh. So what they did, they shot me up with seven days worth of uh, penicillin, put me on the plane with a high fever. So, you know, I'm 17, I don't know. And so uh, Willie White, at the time, she was uh, on the plane with me, and she said, oh, this child is sick. Right. You know, why is she on this plane? And so they said, okay, so once I got to Mexico, after we had to do our um, interviews with the media, and we went to the, uh, to the Olympic Village, then they rushed me off to the infirmary. Mm. So I was there for almost two weeks, okay. eating ice cream and chicken broth. <laughs> lost all my weight, lost all uh, everything. Okay. And then um, after that, I was out there trying to get it together. Get back your strength and get back in shape. Yeah. Yeah. And then Wendy popped up some kind of way on in the Olympic Village. I don't know how she got there, but uh, she walked in and I was just upset, crying and. Nobody would help me, and you know. So she said, "Okay, we forget all of that. We concentrate on what you have to do." And um, she got me, you know, back on track. Okay. 
but I was still kind of weak, so but I had to do what I had to do. All right. So I made it through all those preliminaries to the finals okay. and all those races. So then your events come up. Mm-hmm. And my event came up at the 100. I did a false start, mm. and um, I came in fifth. Mm. And I was upset about that because the 100 was my race. But then, um, um, can they pause this? No. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and so then I, I was upset about that. And then Wendy had reminded me fifth in the world is not bad. Yeah. You know, right. you're fifth I mean, in the world, on, all the these world. people. Yeah. So I looked at it that way. And then the, the 200, I came in seventh. Seventh in the world is not bad. Then I said, okay, now with the relay, I have to make sure that my leg. This is after pneumonia. Yeah, I mean, this is on. after pneumonia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so in my mind, um, I had to uh, do make sure that the the leg that I was running that I kept, if we had a lead or if we didn't have a lead, I had to do the best I could do to get it, the baton to Mildred. You know, so I did that, so I was fine. Yeah. And then, but our handoffs were kind of raggedy because mm -hmm. we didn't practice that much because ties came up missing for five days so we couldn't practice all together. Okay. <laughs> but we got a goal. You we got a goal. goal and the world's record right. and the world's record uh, stood for eight years. So yes. Okay. That's, that's not bad. There you go. There you go. So you come back home 17 senior high school. Yeah and then uh, come back home and uh, was on the plane, and people on the plane says, "Who? Why are the all these people out there?" Mind you, the airport is nothing like it is today. Right. You know, <laughs> it was just like a hub type thing, and you, and you had to wait outside for the people to come out off the plane, and you didn't, you know. So when you got off the plane, you had to walk across and then come through the gate and you go home. Right. And I, you know, and they said, "Why are all these people out there?" I said, "I don't know," because I had no idea that the almost the whole city was at the airport to greet me back home. So that was exciting to see all those people out there. Yeah. Uh. And then um, I got a, uh, they had a, a Margaret Johnson Bell's Day, October, I think, 17th yeah. or something. Right. They dedicated that day for me and then um, got a key to the city, got a parade. So it was nice. Okay. All right. Went back to high school and, you know, had assemblies. So I talked to, you know, the uh, student body and then was back to normal. Okay. All right. Um, so you left the area for a while. I left the area. Um, my husband got a better job. Mind you, I was married at 16. Mm -hmm. And he had gotten a better job <clears throat> in Oakland, so we had to move. And so I moved away, had my daughter, stayed away until she um, went to junior high, and I decided, okay, she needs to come back here. Yeah. Because in Oakland, she had all the diversity, but I wanted her to be able to deal with uh, a not-so-diverse community. Yes. So she would see what it was like. Eugene is a good crucible for that, I yeah. must say. <laughs> and so, in, in the plus, the school, the uh, education is better in yeah, California. Right. So, I moved back here in 82. And uh, she was going, yeah, junior high, so she went to Jefferson. She had the same PE teachers I did. Then she went, moved on to Churchill, same PE teachers. And they thought that she was me, so I had to go back and tell them no. No. She's not, she's her own person, and she's not athletic. She didn't get the genes. So then they said, okay. So um, she stayed up here until she graduated. But you did coach them. Churchill. You did coach Churchill. Mm -hmm. I coached Churchill. Uh, and they went to, and they took state. Yes. And the first time since I left. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the reason why uh, I got involved in coaching track is because my nephew was uh, in the 12th grade. Mm. 
and he would ask me, he said, could you come please help us because this coach doesn't know what he's doing and, you know, da 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 my yeah. times are not going down. Yeah. So I said, okay, so I volunteered. I said, okay, I'll come and, you know, if it's all right, I'll do it. Coach said, sure. So he uh, let me coach the sprinters. And then we went on, well, I changed some, you know, techniques around. And then I had them do the swamp, uh, I call it swamp training. Because at Churchill they had, uh, is what it rains, it, the field got real swampy. <laughs> yes. And it, so, it is a wetland. Yeah. <laughs> this the, is a floodplain. Yeah. <laughs> so, dance, so I used <laughs> that to my advantage because for resistant training, couldn't take them to the coast. Right. So right. I said, we'll do this swamp training. And so what I do, they had to run full out in the swamp. And then when they get uh, uh, on the track, they were faster. Right, right. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant move. <laughs> so it's at that, this point, because uh, we talked about this earlier, that uh, you get an invitation from the university for an athletic scholarship. Yeah. I believe uh, you, when we talked uh, uh, eight years ago, they had asked you if you could still... Uh, run a 1,200 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, run said, a 12. every day with the boys. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean a 12, uh, 12, 12 five or something, or something, or something like yeah. that. I said, yeah, right. I run a 12 flat. You know, I can still run a 12 flat. So then they offered me a, a full scholarship. But the conditions on the scholarship was I had to quit my job. I was working for Hewlett Packard. I had to move in student housing. And uh, so my question was, well, okay, who's going to take care of my finances if I can't work? I have a house in Oakland, a daughter to raise, so how am I going to do all this? They said, well, they didn't know. I said, well, no, thank you. <laughs> because I, I wasn't going to lose everything to get an education. Oh, at least no thank you. Yeah, or as it, Richard Pryor would say, mighty white of you. To you know, I mean, wait a minute, you're offering me a college education, but I have to give up my job, mortgage, rent. Yeah, everything. You know, child care. You know, to benefit them. To benefit you. Mm -hmm. well, slavery's over, excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> so I said, no, yeah. no thank you. I called yeah. Wendy in Canada and told her, she said, oh, no, what about the alumni? They give these football Please. players. Please. You know, an, Thank a, you. You know, the football players get all this stuff. They get Porsches, and they're living up in nice, you know. Hello. Yeah. But see, okay. again, right. that's the female The female thing. But they did have a female track team, obviously. That's why they're offering the scholarship, you know. But well, you're yeah, 32. But they didn't have a sprinter. They didn't have a sprinter. Mm -mm. They have, most of you, if you look at it, most of the university, uh, is known for distant running. Right. Now, right. He, well, Harry was their number one sprinter. Harry Jerome, mm -hmm. right. And so, after him, who was it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so right. most of their stuff is uh, distant running. Yeah. So, I'd say that's a blunder, and uh, I guess, you know, I mean, as I said yesterday and at the beginning of the program, that would be a diss. <laughs> Again, you know, yeah. so, you know, I mean, offer something to the mutual advantage that's, you know, if they're offering you a scholarship to beef up their track team, at least they could show you some respect and do some kind of work around, but they didn't do that. Right. And uh, so I, I don't think it's inaccurate uh, to describe then your experience as part of civil rights history and not just simply an athletic achievement because, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed in, in, in the Guard article, uh, not that that's the only uh, record of history, but seem that a lot of people just, you know, oh, the forgotten champion. Well, a lot of people didn't forget you <laughs> and haven't forgotten you. So I guess, you know, it depends on who we're talking about. So, I mean, this is like civil rights, really. And so a lot of, uh, in terms of looking at that, you know, can you describe your job? I mean, when we talked about this, you know, you're basically, you were selling gene splicing equipment the last time I talked to you. Okay. The last time you talked to me, I worked for a um, biotech company, right? Biotech, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now I work for a, a water company. Okay. So. What do you do? I'm the same thing, contracts manager. Okay. So what I do is negotiate and read and contracts to make sure okay. our company is, can comply to whatever a, the customer wants or 
or could, yeah. So that's what I do. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is life after athletics, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's, yeah. I mean, you have, you, you, your survival mode kicks in, right. you know? I mean, nowadays, I mean, the athletes are getting paid. We didn't get paid. Yes. At all. In fact, the men probably got paid under the table, which mm -hmm. we knew they did. They got shoes and, and sweats. Uh, the women um, got shoes mm, a little bit, but not like the men. Yeah. We didn't get no money. Yeah. So it's like, okay. Right. I mean. So women back, even in the, uh, if you look at the history of the 68 Olympics, if you look at the footage, you would not know that there were women running. Mm. Five women got gold medals. Five women got gold mm -hmm. medals, but but you wouldn't know it, right? Because of the John Carlos and right, John and Tommy, Tommy, right? They overshadowed Bob Beeman. Yeah, yeah. And so that's uh, another um, gripe that the women's team has right to this day, is because everything, every, all the footage you all see is just Tommy and, and Carlos. Right, right. And so when we had went to our reunion in. Um, in New Orleans, they were showing the footage, and we're looking, we're waiting, and we don't see any women. No. Not even what we did, and we had a gold medal. Madeline Manning, you know. Right. Even, okay, even, even to this day. To, right. You know, so it was, you know, it's like, okay, the women was just like, it, you know, they was just women. Just like when they um, was talking about boycotting, we weren't included in anything. I didn't know anything about what was going on until I seen it when I was practicing for the relay. Mm. And then I couldn't understand why it was a big deal, why they made a big deal out of it. Because I didn't understand why it was, why they was kicking them out, out the Olympic Village and why, yeah. you know, they were threatening to take their medals, which they didn't. But if you read the paper, you swear that they stripped them of their medals and all that. No, they didn't. Um, so it's like, we weren't included in that either. So, it's just sexist. Yes, <laughs> to this day. Yeah. So, how would you encourage people today, particularly women athletes? Well, today I would say, okay, you know, um, you you would have to keep your your eye on on your your goal. Mm -hmm. And don't let anything, anybody, uh, deter you off of what you have in your mind to do. Um, and drugs is not going to help you. Right. So, and so if I was to talk to any of the women on the, on the, uh, the team now, don't start that drug stuff because all it does is tear your body down. Because look what, look at Marion. Right. You know, look I was, at any of them. Yeah. I mean, and look at what you did without that. I mean, exactly. root beer mm -hmm. and wheat germ oil. I yeah. Mean, and that's not a training regimen, but I mean, you know, one can talk about natural talent, but mm -hmm. there was also coaching there. Right. And encouragement there. And, you know, some of the classic things in terms of, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think I'm putting words in your mouth because you said this already, but I mean, your goals are not just your achievements on the track, but your goals are beyond the track. Exactly. Too. Having an education. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, and I looked at the, the times, and the times, well, yeah, 10, 7, 10, 9, 10, 8, no, 10, 8. Um, that was b better than what we did, but if you l keep looking, it was 11, 11, 1, mm -hmm. 11, 2, 11, mm -hmm. 3. So, still, they're running what we was running. Right. And they have all this technology. Yes. <laughs> and you had nothing. Nothing. Right. I mean, was the four-minute mile broken <laughs> or achieved or, you know, w with drugs? No, no, it was not. I know. So. But I think, personally, I think it's because of the professionalism and the contracts that puts pressure on these athletes today that make them have to have to drive to make them better. Mm -hmm. You know, because you look at, you know, you, Nike is telling them, okay, okay, if you if you 
do a personal best, you get a bonus money, and right. if you break a world's record, you get this amount of money. Right. And so it's ta it takes all the fun out of track. Right. You know, if they stripped them all down and say, okay, no more this, and no more that, and let's see who's, who's the real athlete. Because most of them are driven by money. Right. And, and, and we were just driven by just pure, we wanted to go. But also, and I can't emphasize this point, I mean, as an educator, I can't emphasize this point enough. Your goal has to be beyond the money exactly. and something else. Because it's like, I, my standard of reference, because this is how I was raised by you know, the athletes mm -hmm. that are in my family, mm -hmm. you know, are educators uh, or civil rights activists mm -hmm. or, so, you know, I mean, and these are black people. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, the Paul Robesons, the, right. you know, and, you know, I'm not going to name the people in my family that don't, you know, are not known, but, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what they do. Right. You know, I mean, actually, my Uncle Burl was the first black referee in the NFL. Okay. You know? <laughs> With, uh, you know, uh, while being a su assistant superintendent in San Francisco Unified. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but a football scholar. And, you know, kids go to Berkeley and, you know, right. one of the kids are, you know, for the Bears now. But, mm -hmm. again, the same thing. Your, your goal is beyond, um, you know, the, the playing field into life. Because right. that's where you're going to succeed. Because your athletic career is only going to be happening as long as you're young enough to compete. Exactly. It's a very narrow window. And back then, you was only, you know, you were, as long as you was on the track, you was a hero. Off the track, you was just another person. Right. So or another N-word, depending yeah. on where you were, right? And exactly. So, you know, again, you, you still have to succeed. So did I hear you mention that you were going to school again? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm in an accelerated program to get my BA. So okay. I have it in August of next year. All right. In um, BA uh, in what? In, uh, business administration. Okay. Concentration on project management. Okay. To go with what I've been doing for the last 20 years. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, might as well get the degree since you've already proved you can do it for yeah, the last so, 20 years. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just for it to be on my resume. Uh, just so I can put this out now, because we, we talked about this. Um, briefly Monday, um, given uh, the educational experiences you've had uh, in Eugene, particularly with the trials, the U of O, and all that other kind of stuff, would an, uh, you would accept an honorary degree? Yes. From them? I would. Yeah, because that's been educational in itself. Exactly. <laughs> I sure would. I mean, they're, they're, I, mean I think they have a lot of making up to do here, you know? I mean, if... Uh, you get Oprah Winfrey and all them, they get honorary degrees. Right. Bill Cosby, they get, why can't I have one? Sure. We'll have to inquire about that. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, if um, you were to do this again today, where would you start? If someone were to basically, you know, offer you a job, you know, producing athletes the old-fashioned way, not just being able to excel on the field, but mm -hmm. in life, and you were designing that project, you had that project, what for, would that look like? Well, first of all, I just found out by talking to the coach in Churchill that the kids are being charged to 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 participate in sports. Yes. And that was that blew me away. I mean $150 per kid. Right. Now, if that had happened when I was coming up, wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. Right. And to me, a lot of kids are being looked over because they their parents can't afford the $150. So you might have very talented kids who parents can't afford the the $150 who's who, who uh, nobody will know about. Yeah. So if I was to come up here and, and start a program or whatever, first of all, I would concentrate on the underprivileged kids. Okay. That would be my first concentration. Okay. And then I would go to all these Nike and all these people who have uh, sporting goods stores and 
and get them to donate shoes, uniforms for these kids. And then I would start, um, get the kids together, and then I would want to know what their goals are. That's the first thing. When I started uh, coaching at uh, Churchill, the first thing I wanted, I, they gave, I gave them homework. Hmm. What homework? Well, first thing I wanted Coach to know. Coach Margaret? Yeah, the first thing I wanted to know was, was your goals. Hmm. Whether it was athletic or not, what, what is your goal in life? What do you want to do? Because if you didn't have any, then we have to work on that. What was your goal? I mean, if my goal was to go to Mexico. Okay. Mexico okay. City. Okay. That was my goal. All right. That that was my goal. I mean, you for example, I mean, we I think we talked about this off camera before we began. So, your um your father was a musician. Mhm. Mm right? So he traveled around and you were born in New York and you know, he he traveled around on um what was what we refer to as the Chitlin circuit. Mm -hmm. So, black musician, uh, he played bass for uh, Nat King Cole's brother, mm -hmm. and uh, you know obviously they came through Eugene mm -hmm. at some point, and you know so he came here. So you grew up here, right? right? Uh, but that wouldn't necessarily you know give you an exposure to the world. So you wanted to go to Mexico. You wanted to see the world because mm -hmm. he had done that obviously. Yeah, as part of a touring, being a touring musician. Right. right. He went to Hawaii and all that stuff. But I wanted, when Wendy told me it was in Mexico City, I said, okay, I want to go there. Okay. All right. And so that was my goal. And then when I got there, I got to meet uh, Wilma Rudolph. Wow. Mm hmm And then she gave me a lecture about me being the baby of the team and I should be at bed at 9 o'clock. And I'm telling them, mm-mm. No, that doesn't work no way, no more. <laughs> <laughs> but you know those type of things. Well, well, Wilma was old, raised old school, so you right. could understand that. Right? Yeah, and she was under uh, Temple, so you know, and she was young, so she had to be in the bed at nine o'clock. Yeah. So it was, but I, I, I got to meet her. But that was that would be the first thing I do with these kids. I say, okay, what are your goals? You know, um, if you didn't have any, we had to figure out some. Because you have to have a goal, all right, in, in order to achieve anything in life. So then, next, what what next steps? Then after I got that back, then we would go into the training. Then I'd have to figure out who's a sprinter, who's a not a sprinter, you know, and just work from there. Swamp training, mm -hmm. but there, what swamp training for the mind then, for example? Well, when you do swamp training, it can eat eat. eat either can defeat you or make you strong yeah. because swamp training is hard. Yeah. So, and they wasn't allowed to quit. Right. So it was like, okay, so I can't do this. Oh, no, we get rid of the word can't. There's no such thing as can't. So you get out there and you do it again. And if they stopped, they had to do it again. So then it's, it's, it's like helping them to go uh, beat their hurdles, go, you know, run through their hurdles in life because swamp training is part of life. Right. You know, when you come up against a hurdle, either you're going to go through it or you're going to go around it, you're going to go over it, or you're going to stay on this side and you won't achieve anything. Or if you're running a steeplechase, you know, yeah. getting your feet wet is part of yeah, I the mean, whole thing. The whole right? thing, yeah. you know, so it's like, mm -mm. So, yeah, everything I did was, it was hard for them. I mean, I had kids throwing up because they, they chose to eat burritos before a workout. <laughs> well, they had been doing that before. Right. But, you know, with me, no, okay, so why are you throwing up? Well, I had a burrito, well. You don't eat like that before you work out. So it was part of the training. Yeah. So they learned. Delayed gratification, mm -hmm. discipline. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's part of me meeting your goal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. That'd be it. Okay. Simple. Keep it simple. Because the Nike, the Nikes would argue that they do stuff like that already. Really? <laughs> you have some doubts, huh? <laughs> well, I, I mean, what do they do? Yeah, well. 
I mean, they may have that kind of, uh, I don't think they do. I don't think they do either. Because mm -mm, everything's so technical. Yeah. So they send them down there to the, to the uh, Olympic training camp and they sit there and take pictures of them and try to improve their strides and, you know, their workouts. But I'm talking about grassroots. Right. You know, tr get them trained up like that. I mean, you can see some of the advantages of what Wendy put you through. Yeah. Right. And most people aren't do are still not doing those kind of things. Yeah, because without, w Wendy put me through, helped me through life. Yeah. You know, it, not only on the track, but, you know, to be able to uh, deal with uh, disappointments. Um, don't have pity parties for too long because you have to figure out how you're going to go to the next step. Mm -hmm. All this came through my training in track. You know, somebody tell you no, don't take no for an answer. So, and, and that's the way I, um, I'm at on my job. You know, I don't take no for an answer. If I, you know, somebody, I don't know something, well, okay, I'll find out. You know? Way around it. it mm hmm Yeah. So she helped me a lot. And I think more coaches should do that get on a more mental thing instead of a money thing. Yeah. Because it's all about the money now. Yeah. Mental, yeah. not money. Not money. Okay. Uh, so, not that your life is over, but looking back and, <laughs> and, and thinking about, you know, what, what final thing would you, would you say to, uh, you know, any final thoughts? Well, I wouldn't take anything back that I went through. Okay. Because I learned from that. Yeah. And I think it made me a better person. Um, not looking for handouts and all that stuff, you know, you just, so I wouldn't change anything that I went through. Yeah. I mean, because I, I read, you know, oh, it's tragic that, you know, she, you know, could have gone farther. Come on, you know. Well, and see, and, and like everybody who was interviewed me said, well, have you ever did you ever think about going back? Well, no, because at that time, <laughs> I was dealing with just my child. Yes, and, and let's, and, let's you know, prioritize. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know, this is that, real life. And that okay. woulda, shoulda, coulda stuff yeah. is not going to work. And so, you and know. And you were coached to that anyway. Yes. Yeah. So, so, no, I didn't think about uh, what I could have did four years later. Um, I mean, you have a lot to be proud of still, what you have yet to accomplish. Right. You know. So, yeah, I don't regret anything that I, you know, um, it was, it was, what I went through is what I was supposed to go through. Yeah. I'm a firm believer yeah. of that. Yeah. That, that's, you know, I was supposed to. Your steps to, were guided. With guidance, so, yeah. and they still are being guided, yeah. so I just go with the flow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't look back and say, well, if I didn't do this, what I would, no, because that doesn't do anything to help you. Right. Well, I mean, it, it is perfect because, again, you know, you have one of the, high, the highest uh, uh, athletic achievement mm -hmm. in your lifetime, okay? You know, you've, you've set goals, you've accomplished them, you know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, even your grace in being dissed. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because I watch your face when I said you know, it's like oh, there's a little, well, yeah, but you know, you're not bitter about that. No. You know, you know again, you know, people ask, well, why didn't she come back to Eugene? Oh, I said, a lot of people leave Eugene. The world is bigger than Eugene. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, props to Eugene for, you know, okay, having a better school system than Oakland. Right, so, but uh, economically, yeah. I, I, what would I do? What would I have done in Eugene? Right. They didn't have a Hewlett Packard. Yes. You know, they didn't have the uh, biotech back then. Uh, so what would I have done? Right. There With no education. Right. Nothing. So. So I had yeah, to go. You made yeah. it. Mm-hmm. You made it. And, um, and we're glad you're here. We'll be glad to have you back. Okay. I'll be glad to come back. So if you've liked what you've seen, uh, email us at liveclass at lanecc.edu. Uh, give us feedback. 
and uh, we'll try and have Margaret and maybe Wendy back <laughs> at some point because you know when we talk about people succeeding on a larger field in athletics, I think you're one of the great examples of doing this. Well, and thank I want you. To thank you. Thank you. So this has been Diversa TV. I'm uh, Mark Harris, and uh, go well, stay well. We'll see you soon.